bulletins. We're going to go over some prayer focus items. Bill, and I was with Bill the other day, I've been with Bill every day since Thursday, and he pronounces his name right. So from now on, he's Bill Wright, okay? But for sadness, Bill is not doing well. Bill is in hospice care over here in Munster. And um, so keep the family in mind. Uh, Bill is nearing home. So uh, keep the family in mind. There's some other needs on here. Uh, Megan, a New Life Bible Church, Gail out in Africa. Are there other things that we need to make mention of that are not in the bulletin that you can read? Yes. Um, I talked to Gail Thomas, Gail and Ken and her daughter Jennifer Christopher went here. Um, Gail's living in Africa and she has Florida now and her daughter in, in Montana. They, uh, Jennifer had a baby July 30th and he had no openings in his head and no stuff in his head. And so he went into surgery right before Christmas and it was a very serious surgery. They didn't know what was going to happen with it. And they cut him from ear to ear, pulled it back, and rebuilt the back of his head because his head was just flat. And and he was it was it was pretty hard on the family and everything. But he is doing wonderfully. He's back to his sweet little self. But he also has to have another surgery come June or July, and they'll open them up again at the same place and pull his, everything forward. And they're going to fix the eye socket here and uh, part of his head where the skull does move forward. So he's got that second surgery starting in June. So. I would appreciate if you would keep him in prayer from then until that time, and then after that he may have to have some plastic surgery to, you know, fix everything. But he's doing very, very well after the surgery, and Gail and Ken just got home tonight before that. I talked to her, and uh, they still need to pray. It's tough being a long-distance grandmother. She had to travel from St. Pete to Seattle for the surgery, so um, just keep the whole family in prayer, and the Heisman and Jennifer particularly. And Baby Towns. The baby's name is Towns. Okay, that's, that is encouraging. Any others? Let me mention them. Let's go over time. Lord Jesus, we come into this new year. To be honest, we're a little apprehensive. A lot of changes going on. A lot of new things happening. But at the same time, we're hopeful because this is your church and you've promised us that the gates of hell will never ever prevail against it. So we're trusting in you, we're trusting in you to lead us and to guide us. We pray for those who are on the list this morning that, that uh, have special concern, Bill, and his, his family and baby talents and the family and, and all those that are affected by that. And we just ask that your blessing be upon them and comfort Bill in this, in this time. And we just pray that all of us will be ready to meet you when our time comes. Be with the service today. May your, your spirit just be uh, abounding in this place. And it's in your name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> Two elderly couples were enjoying friendly conversation. When one of the men asked the other, Fred, how was the memory clinic you went to last month? Outstanding, Fred replied. They taught us all the latest psychological techniques. The visualization, association, it made a huge difference in me. That's great. What was the name of that clinic? Mm, Fred went blank. He thought, he thought, he couldn't remember. And a smile broke across his face. And he asked, what do you call that flower with a long stem and thorns? You, you mean a, a rose, Fred? That's it. He turned to his wife and said, Hey, Rose, what was the name of that clinic? <laughs> Say the great confession with me, would you? I believe I Jesus believe. is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. That's what we built this church around, right? That's what Jesus built this church around. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. That's what we build our lives on. That's what we want to build the future on. The future on that Jesus is the Christ. 
The book of John, the fifth chapter, says it has an amazing thing to say. And if you open your Bibles to the book of John, the fifth chapter, for just a second, we're going to just kind of go by there. One of the things I want to tell you, you definitely want to bring your Bibles. Uh, there's going to be some of the verses that are going to be up on the screen, but I want to hear pages right. So bring your Bibles. Five, uh, the book of John, the fifth chapter, the 39th verse says this. It's really interesting. He says, he's talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious people. And he says to them, you search the scriptures because you think they will give you eternal life. But the scripture points to me. The scriptures point to Jesus. If you are reading scripture because you feel obligated, or if you're reading scripture because you're doing it out of duty, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're not going to get anywhere. It's not going to have an impact in your life. When you read the scripture to discover Jesus, oh man, that's when the scripture comes alive. The scripture is not intended for us to worship. The scripture is there for us to find out who Jesus is. Because that's what the Bible is about. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, it is about Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to read about for the next few weeks. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he says, I resolve to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for Randy Payne. So as long as I'm in this pulpit, all you're going to get a steady diet of is Jesus Christ. Because that is our hope. Colossians, the second chapter, says this. Build your life on Jesus. Build your roots down deep in Him. Why? Paul goes on to say, so that you will not fall prey to the nonsense that people come up with in their teachings. Colossians 2nd chapter 7th verse. That's what we do. We, we, we build our lives on Jesus. And we find Jesus in the Scripture. The trouble is, we get some crazy ideas about who Jesus is. So we're going to go over the next few months, we're going to go over the book of John, and we're going to find and discover who Jesus is, who the real Jesus is. Keep this in mind, Jesus is the same when? Yesterday, yesterday today, today, and forever. So the Jesus that we find in the book of John is the same Jesus that was there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he's the same Jesus for David, he's the same Jesus for Peter and Andrew and James and John, and he's the same Jesus for us today. The things that the Bible reveals to us about Jesus are forever. They're going to be unchanging. The qualities we find out about Jesus will never change because that's the way he always is. That's the way he always will be. When, when Moses came to the burning bush and he said, who is this? God said, I am. In other words, what God was saying is, I'm just being myself. And when Jesus was here on the earth, he was just being himself. He was just being who Jesus was. And that is the same Jesus that continues to this day. So we're going to go through the book of John, and we're going to try and discover who this Jesus is. And like the, the, the series we're going through right now, we want to fall in love with Jesus all over again. So let's go to the book of John, the 17th chapter. The 22nd verse, and we're going to discover this verse. It says, I have given them the glory. He's talking to the, the apostles, the disciples. He says, I have given them the glory you gave me. Why? So that they may be one as we are <coughs> one. You know in the Trinity, there's no division. You know in the Trinity, there's no backbiting. You know, in the Trinity, there's no jealousy. You know, in the Trinity, there's no power struggle. Nobody's trying to get their own way. The complete unity. That's why the Trinity is so hard to describe, and that's why it's so hard to understand. Because it's hard to see when the Holy Spirit begins and when Jesus begins, when the Father begins, because they're completely one in, mer in, in, in mission, and in purpose and in focus. There is no division. And it's always been that way. They have always been together. And that's point number one this morning is this. God is a God of unity. Have you ever noticed in the scripture 
that there is never a time when Jesus said, my father wants me to do this, but I think I'm going to do this. When Jesus was here, he says, I do what my father, I see my father doing. I say what I hear my father saying. Complete unity. Complete fellowship. A oneness that is there that has always been. Do you think that one day, stop and think back a few years. Do you think that one day God was sitting around in heaven and, and, and Jesus and Holy Spirit, Father were sitting around and Jesus was kind of kicked back, relaxing and God says, uh, hey Jesus, what are you doing today? I don't know. I kind of thought maybe I'd make a universe or something. Well, Holy Spirit, what are you doing today? I don't know. I'm kind of bored. Uh, what do you say we make them in my image? And Jesus would say, no, 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 no. We're going to make them in my image. The Father says, nah, I'll tell you what. Why don't we make them in all of our images? Nah, let's just do something different. Anything like that ever go on? Of course not. They were in complete, total harmony and unity and mind and focus and purpose. Now, we don't know how everything transpired. We don't know how everything kind of came to be. But we kind of get inklings of it in the, in, throughout the scripture. And it seems like it kind of went like this. And we don't know this for sure, but this is kind of the way it seems like. That God had created eternal beings called angels. And he made one angel to be the prince of angels. And he named him Lucifer. And this Lucifer wanted to have the fellowship that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had. He wanted to be in there. And he got full of himself. And he got prideful. And he tried to become like God. And he deceived a third of the angels. And there was a war in heaven. And God removed Lucifer from his spot. And he put Michael in his place. And there was a war. And Satan Lucifer was, cut, was cast out of heaven. It's a pretty big deal. It was such a big deal to God that he made us to fight that war with him against evil. So the first sin was pride. The very first thing that happened in, here, in, in, in history that we could kind of figure out was that someone wanted to be just like God. And it hasn't changed. But the Trinity by itself is perfect, total fellowship. God's plan for the church is this. Jesus demands unity in his church. That they may be one just as we are one. Correct? That is what the scripture says. That's what Jesus' prayer is. That we would be united in, in, in mission and in focus and in purpose just like the Trinity is. That's what God's intention is for us as a church. But we've got a problem. The problem is us. If we go to the book of Philippians, the second chapter, we're going to get there in a minute. We have a problem, and the problem is us. There was a, a guy who was marooned on an island, and he was there for a long time. And finally, one day, he was rescued. And as he boarded the, 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 the ship, the captain looked back, and he saw three huts. He saw a hut on the left, and he saw a hut in the middle, and he saw a hut on the right. And so he says to the man, he says, what's, what's the hut on the left for? He says, well, that's my church. Oh, really? Well, what's the hut in the middle for? He says, well, that, that's my home. Well, what's the hut on the right for? He says, oh, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> you see, he was by himself. And, and <laughs> but we see, we've had a problem, don't we? The problem is that we have difficulty getting along with each other. And it seems like history has been fraught with people who have a hard time getting along with each other. How many people have died over the last 70 years because they couldn't get along with one another? I'll tell you the number. It's nearly 200 million. World War I, World War II, World War II, there's 50 million people. After World War II, Mao went in charge in China and nearly 80 million people died. They don't have the exact numbers, it's just a speculation. In Russia, 20 million people were killed by their own governments. People have a long history of killing each other and not getting along. But it's not always been that way. There was one time when people got together and really did something incredible. And if we go back to the book of Genesis, the 11th chapter, we're going to find this. 
This one time when people really did something astounding together. It's called the Tower of Babel. And here's how it goes. Verse 1. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words, and the people migrated to the east. They found a plain there called Babylonia and settled there. Verse 3. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. <coughs> Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. Now, this is how powerful this is. This is what, this is what God has to say about it. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. This is what God said about humanity, yeah, about humanity when they're united. <laughs> that nothing will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the people of different languages so that they will not be able to understand each other. And the curse of Babylon continues on to this day, doesn't it? We have a hard time understanding that, understanding each other. Because their selfish ambition was going to be, we don't need God anymore. Friends, we need God. The church needs to be built around Jesus Christ. Because He is our unifier. He is the one common thing that we all have. It's Him. Now, we have a problem, and the problem is that we have a hard time getting along with each other. It's nothing new. It's been going on for thousands of years, and guess what? The early church had the same problem. They had trouble getting along with each other. So Paul, in several different epistles, begins to address that problem. So we're going to go to the book of Galatians, the second, or, excuse me, the book of, of uh, Philippians, the second chapter, and we're going to read and see what is said there. And let's start with the very first verse. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Well, there's problem number one, isn't it? Agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. That's hard to do. Amen. It's really hard to do. Why? Because we all have different ideas. We all want to do things differently. I want to, you know, I've been the worship leader here for five years, and we're still not doing the music I want to do. If we did the music I want to do, nobody would come. So we had to kind of, you know, work around that a little bit. Hey, if you did come, you'd be deaf. But that's just kind of what I like, okay? Agree wholeheartedly with each other. Now, what else does he say? He says, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. You know, that's only possible in one way, and that is we are united around Jesus Christ. We have to be. There's no other way. Now, let's continue on. This is where the rubber hits the road. Don't be selfish. Oh, man. Kills already, doesn't it? Don't be selfish. That is so hard not to be selfish. You know, when you get married and you start having children, that's when you start learning to try not to be selfish, isn't it? When you start putting your wife or your husband above yourself and start putting your children above yourself, that's when you start learning not to be selfish. Well, that's a tough one there. Listen, all else he has to say. It says this. Don't try to impress others. Oh, <laughs> I'm already guilty of that. I'm wearing a stupid tie. <laughs> Next week I'm coming in shorts and a golf shirt just to throw everybody <laughs> off. Don't try to impress others. Man, that's hard, isn't it? We live our whole lives trying to impress other people. We buy our cars to impress other people. We paint our houses to impress other people. Now maybe we like that, but a lot of it is, is to impress other people. 
So we're not our real authentic selves. Oh man, this is a hard list. I should have picked something else. Now he goes on to say, be humble. Oh. I'm humble as the other guy is not humble. <laughs> be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves, no way. Man, that's hard, isn't it? It's a tough list. That's a tough list. How can we be humble? How can we love one another? How can we agree with one another wholeheartedly? How can we, how can we do all these things? Not looking out for our own interests, but taking an interest in others too. Yeah, you're going to have some self-interest. Of course you are. But don't just worry about your own interest. Be thinking about other people as well. Oh, that is so difficult. How are we going to pull this off? You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. The funniest religious joke ever voted on goes like this. Once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, I'm a Christian. He said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist conservative or Northern liberal Baptist? He said, Northern conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern conservative Baptist Eastern region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him off. <laughs> isn't that crazy? It's funny, but isn't that what happens to us? We become so divided over such silly things. We become divided over the things that Jesus never intended for us to become divided over. Here's the case in point. Let's go. We're going to come back to this. Pick one of these. There's five choices here. You only get to pick one of them. And I'm going to list them off to you. And then, after, and then after I've listed them off, you raise your hand for which musical style you like the most. We have the categories. The big band, 50s, 60s. Well, I'm talking about 50s. Anything in the 50s, you know, like uh, Elvis. 60s, like the Beatles. 70s, like, uh, you Leonard, know. Leonard Skinner. Leonard Skinner. <laughs> <laughs> or, or country. I tried country one time, but nobody could figure out the country it was, so I, I didn't know. <laughs> Okay, so who do we have big band? All right, big band. How about 50s music? Elvis and the Light, okay, a couple of things. How about 60s? Beatles and such, 60s? 70s, Leonard Skinner and the Bunch, okay, that, that would be me. All right, country, who, who likes country? Oh, do you see the problem? <laughs> Do you see the problem? We've got big band, 50s, 60s, 70s, and country. Everybody likes something different, don't they? So when we come together as a body, do you see a potential of some friction? Because I like one kind of music and you like another, and somebody else wants something else, and somebody else likes something else. You see the problem here? Here's the solution. You have 23, you, you have six days, 23 hours, and 40 minutes to listen to the kind of music you want to. You can listen to it on your phone, you can listen to it in your car, you can listen to it in your iPod, you can listen to it anywhere you want. But when we come together, we have to find some common ground. Because that's what unity means. That we think of others above ourselves. We have the example of this. Let's go back a little bit. We have the example of this in Jesus Christ. Look at this. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. The same attitude.
Christ gave us a commission. He says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or some verses said, go make disciples. Does it say go make disciples of Randy Payne? Does it say go make disciples of Ray Hess? Does it say go make disciples of Dennis Keller? Of Craig Gillen? Neil Thomas? It says make disciples of who? Of him. See, the unity is found in Jesus Christ. We come together when we start acting like Jesus. We start having the attitude that Jesus did. We start having the mindset that Jesus had. So here's the solution. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. How was that displayed? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, though he was God, he didn't try to hold on to it. What does he do? Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born in the form of a human being. My friends, when Paul talks about being humble, that is humility. Bill Ryder and I were talking on Thursday. And we were laughing about things and said, we started laughing about the funny things that Jesus did. And he said to me, he said, you know, God's really funny. I said, you're, you're not a kid and God's funny. Look at some of the funny things that Jesus did. And we start going through all the funny things that Jesus did, and we were really laughing it up. And then Bill said, and Jesus was so humble. That is the Jesus that we need to start emulating. The Jesus that was so humble. Let's take a look at some of the areas that he was so humble. His birth. He was born in a barn. He was born in a stable to a woman born as a virgin. You think the people were talking about that? Do you think the people?